All right, let's see if you remember from last time. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Good job. All right. Uh, today we're going to be doing lesson three in the small catechism. Hopefully you have your syllabus with you. And lesson three today, we are going to be going over the Ten Commandments introduction. We're going to be going over the first and second commandment and meaning. And uh, those will be, uh, you're going to need your small catechism. And of course, you are going to need your uh, hymnal. Always have your hymnal with you. And uh, before we get started, we are going to begin as we always do. So turn to page 32 in your catechisms. Daily prayers, how the head of the family should teach his household to pray, morning and evening. So in the morning, when you get up, make the sign of the Holy Cross and say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. It reminds us of our baptism, the sign of the cross. So let's confess the creed together, kneeling or standing or sitting down. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> and Luther's morning prayer. I thank thee, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger, and I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. And remember, uh, I know sometimes you might think, well, that's just a, you know, two and a half minutes in the video. Uh, oh, it's a waste of time. Let's just get to the class. No. Praying and confessing is never a waste of time. And the way we develop spiritual habits is by doing spiritual things. So just as you might say in the morning, well, it's a waste of time to go to the bathroom. Uh, it's a waste of time to brush my teeth in the morning. It's a waste of time to put on deodorant. It's a waste of time to wash my face. No, good physical hygiene is important. How much more so good spiritual hygiene. So don't ever sell this stuff short. Don't ever think that this is a waste of time. All right, now, before we go to work, uh, we are going to sing the hymn that we said we were going to sing, hymn 766. So if you got your hymnal out, let's sing uh, hymn 766. We're going to sing the first two verses once again. <clears throat> Our Father, who from heaven above bids all of us to live in love as members of one family and pray to you in unity teach us no thoughtless words to say but from our inmost hearts to pray your name be hallowed help us lord in purity to keep your word that to the glory of your name we walk before you free from blame let no false teaching us pervert all poor deluded souls convert. All right, keep singing that hymn over and over again until we learn it. I'm, I'm learning with it, learning it with you now because I realize how important of a hymn it is and because of how, for my own devotional life, how important it would be to have those words uh, on my lips. So when I'm praying the Lord's Prayer or uh, whenever I'm driving the car and I want to sing a hymn and I uh, might as well sing and pray at the same time. So do it. All right, let's do a little bit of review. What is confirmation? Remember, confirmatio, it's a strengthening of faith. All right, uh, church year, first season of the church year. Let's just rattle through them. Ready? What's the first one? Advent. 
Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, Trinity. All right, colors, Advent, blue or violet. Christmas, white, Epiphany, green, Lent, violet, Easter, white, Holy Tr or Festival or Season of Trinity, green, because Holy Trinity Sunday is white. All right, what about uh, Pen Day of Pentecost? What color? Red, because we're celebrating the Holy Spirit. Day of Reformation, red, because we're also celebrating the Holy Spirit. And the gift of faith that comes through the word that only the Holy Spirit can give. All right. Uh, law gospel. What's the law? Oh, come on. What's the law? Let's go. What we do for God and for our neighbor. I feel kind of crazy because there's not actually anyone talking back to me. But I'm just imagining someone being, being cut off guard. What's the gospel? What God does for us, for Jesus' sake. What does the law do? It shows us our sins. What does the gospel do? It shows us our Savior. What's the law? What we do for God and our neighbor. What does the gospel do? Shows us our Savior. What does the law do? Shows us our sins. What is the gospel? What God does for us, for Jesus' sake. Yeah, see, I'm going to invert it and switch it around because I want you to be able to think, 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 think. You don't just memorize things. Think about them so you can actually regurgitate them uh, on your mind, on your lips. Okay. Um, what is the role of uh, reason in Scripture? Reason is the student. Scripture is the teacher good so student the, the re, uh, reason is the student the teacher is god's word it's scripture um six chief parts of the catechism what's first ten commandments what's next the creed the apostles creed what's next the lord's prayer baptism confession office of the keys sacrament of the altar all right good good review all right we are going to jump right into it we're going to get things rolling here uh ten commandments Let's turn to page 54. So page 54 in your small catechisms. Remember your ESV, page 54. <clears throat> what are the Ten Commandments? The Ten Commandments are the law of God. God gave them in this order, but did not number them. I point that out because if you were to look up Exodus chapter 20 or Deuteronomy chapter 5, there is no numbering of the commandments. It simply states the commandments uh, in the order that we memorize them. We supply the numbers. Um, it does refer to 10 uh, commandments of God, but God doesn't give us the specific numbers, but we order them. Okay, uh, so how did God give us the law? Well, let's look at question 14 on page 54. When God created people, he wrote the law on their hearts. Later, he arranged the law in 10 commandments, wrote it on two tables of stone, and made it known through Moses. Now, I'm going to ask you on a test. How many ways did God give us the law? And you're going to answer three. Now, in the catechism, there's only two on our hearts and on two tables of stone. And I want to add a third one. And I want you to write down, hope you can see this. Where is it? And I want you to write right here. And dot, 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 in Scripture. So, and this is important because God's law is not just limited to the Ten Commandments. God's law is all throughout the Bible, all throughout the scriptures. For example, in one of the Paul's letters, it says, do not grumble. So don't complain. Don't be a complainer. In other words, in another place, it says, pray ceaselessly that we should pray. Well, none of the Ten Commandments, no, of course, uh, the Second Commandment has the understanding of prayer. Uh, grumbling and complaining, you could find a way to put that in one of the other commandments. I, I know that to be true. But I just want to point out that it's not the Ten Commandments are not the only place where God has given us his law. Uh, but God's law is written on our hearts, also two tablets of stone, and third on two tablets of stone, and also thirdly, in Scripture. Okay, so three ways. All right, let's keep going. Uh, on the top of page 55, you have this in italics. It says, Bible narrative. God wrote his commandments directly for the Israelites. There are three kinds of law in the Old Testament. The moral law, which tells us all which tells all people their duty toward God and other people. The ceremonial law, which regulated the religious practices in the Old Testament, and the political law, which was the state law of the Israelites. Only the moral law was written into the human heart. Okay, so there are three types of laws. Now, later on, we are going to learn about three uses of the law, and that's different from three types. So type is like a category of law, okay? So the types of laws, moral, ceremonial, and political. I just want to make sure I have the terms right as, as it is in your uh, catechism. <clears throat> now, why does this matter? 
Um, how is this important to you? Because you very well may have the conversation with someone where someone will say, well, God said to do this in the Old Testament. And if you can determine which type of law it is, then you can determine whether or not it's still applicable to today. So, for example, the moral law still matters. You shall not murder anybody. Well, the law is still binding. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not, uh, in other words, you shall not have any sexual relationship outside of marriage. And it, marriage is only between one man and one woman. So that moral law still stands. Now we have things like the ceremonial law, which, as the Catechism says, regulates the religious practices in the Old Testament, such as stuff that goes on in the temple. Well, in the New Testament, we know that Jesus is the temple in the flesh. Okay, so Jesus fulfills the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. So therefore, we don't need to sacrifice animals anymore on an altar. Jesus has become the sacrifice once and for all. So the ceremonial law has been fulfilled in Christ. Now, remember what Jesus says. I did not come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. So Jesus completes the ceremonial law in his person. Okay. And also as a priest, by the way. So as the priests were, were told to do things in the Old Testament, Jesus does those things himself. So I want to make that point also, that it's not just limited to like uh, the, the sacrificial stuff going on in the temple. It's also what the priests had to do. And Jesus fulfills that. Okay, now the last one, um, or the third one, is the political law. The political law. This is the law that pertains specifically to Old Testament Israel. The nation of Israel, as in the country of Israel, with borders. I say nation of Israel because in the New Testament it teaches us that the nation of Israel is not restricted to borders. The nation of Israel is all those Christians who believe in God. Uh, who all, so anyone who has faith is a child of Abraham. Paul says this in Romans and in Galatians, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so uh, the political law is only applicable to ancient Old Testament Israel with a geographical boundary that was gone after the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. So by since 70 AD, Old Testament political law is no, is no more. Now Christ fulfilled that law too because he is also our king. So he is our prophet, priest, and king. He fulfills all the law in his, in his body. So I don't want to say the law was eradicated, but I'm just saying the nation of Israel no longer exists in the same way that it did in the Old Testament. That now the nation of Israel is a people of God and it is, it is that which uh, exceeds borders and it is all people who believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin. So faith makes us the nation of the New Testament Israel. Okay, but once again, to summarize, the moral law matters, and the moral law is summarized in the Ten Commandments, and even more succinctly in the two commandments that Jesus says are the greatest commandments in the New Testament, where he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And those two verses summarize the Ten Commandments. We're going to talk more about that next. So question 15 is what is the summary of commandments one through three, the first table of the law. So when we say first table, remember, how did God give the law? Three ways. On the heart, on two tables or tablets of stone, and in scripture. So the first table of the law, the first tablet is, question 15, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. You need to memorize that. It's an important verse, okay? So however you want to circle it, you need to memorize it because that summarizes the first table of the law. Now next to this question, I want you to write this right here, okay? I want you to write a God with an arrow pointing both ways and then man below, okay? And what this, is, uh, what this teaches us is the first table of the law is between us and God. God and us. First table of the law between man and God. Humans and God. First table of the law. We're going to learn what, the, what that means because, well, I'll just say, let's just do it right now. Because remember, what's the memory work for today? Oh, we haven't done the memory work. Oh, you almost got off the hook. What's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Clearly, first commandment's between us and God. Second command, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord, your God, between us and God. What does this mean? We should... Fear and love God, so we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. Okay, so clearly, first commandment's about God. Second commandment's about God's name. It's between us and God. Third commandment, I know you didn't have to memorize it for today, but we might as well say it. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What does this mean? We should fear and love God, so we do not despise preaching and his word, but... Hold it sacred and gladly hear 
and learn it. Once again, it's between us and God. So first table of the law is between God and man. <clears throat> now let's go to question 16. What is the summary of commandments 4 through 10? Known as the second table of the law, the second tablet of the law. And this is Jesus, these are Jesus' words. And a second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> now, in this space here, I want you to write man with an arrow going to another man. So notice above, we've got arrow going up and down. First table of law between God and man. And now the second table of law is, is, is uh, horizontal. It's man to man. Okay, so first table of law is vertical between God and man. Second table of law is man to man between between our neighbors. That's why you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Summarizes it. The camera turn? I don't know. I'll turn it. Okay. Uh, question 17. Let's keep going. What is the summary of all the commandments? Love. Love is the summary of all the commandments. And look at that Bible verse. I want you to circle it. Circle Bible verse 41, Romans 13:10. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And I want you to underline that last part. Love is the fulfilling of the law because that's what you're going to need to memorize for your test. Now, <clears throat> love does no wrong to a neighbor. This means that we don't allow our neighbor to do things that would hurt him or her, and we don't do things to our neighbor that would hurt him or her. So this means that the concept that you often hear in American politics is live and let live. Well, I'll do my thing, you do your thing. That is the most unloving thing you could ever do. Actually, not do. The most unloving thing you could ever do is to hurt them. The most unloving thing you could omit to do is to let them do whatever they want. So God's word matters. God's word is important. God's word directs our life. So the person who is, who is breaking the sixth commandment, who is living with their significant other outside of marriage, they are hurting themselves. We should not continue to let them hurt themselves. Now, you might say, well, they love each other, right? We hear that all the time. Oh, this, this is love. And love is the most important thing. But if it's love that's not in a godly way and is not a way that God directs, it is harmful to them because it's sin and sin is harmful. The wages of sin is death. We know this from scripture. And so out of love, we want to help our neighbor take care of themselves and do that which is pleasing to God. Okay, let's go to question 18. Whom does God mean when in the Ten Commandments he says, you shall? Well, answer, he means me and all other human beings. Now at the bottom, I want you to write, and hopefully you've got room to do this, write, the commandments are you, but the meanings are we. Notice you and we are in quotes. Now this is really important because remember the first commandments again. You shall have no other gods. The commandments, God is talking to us. So of course he says, you shall have no other gods because he's God. So he makes the command, you, as in you and me. Now in the meanings, when we say, well, what does this mean? Well, the meaning is not God talking. This is Martin Luther wrote the meanings for us. And by the way, he doesn't just make these meanings up. He takes them from scripture, whenever scripture talks about these commandments, and he summarizes them in a very succinct way that helps teach us the essence, the essence, the substance, the meaning of the commandment. So in the meaning of the first commandment, we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So in the meaning we are articulating, we, this is how we understand the commandment to mean, Lord, we should fear, love, and trust in you above all things. All right, let's keep going. Let's get to the first commandment. So we just said it. Let's say it again. You shall have no other gods. Now, here's what I want you to write after that. Write in parentheses or brackets, before me. Because in Hebrew it says, you shall have no other gods before me. And then write an equal sign. And before me equals in my presence. And I teach this all the time. That this, when God gives this commandment, and by the way, I don't like that the catechism took out the words before me because I think they are so important. You shall have no other gods. Now, it gets the point across. You shall have no other gods, period. I mean, that is full stop, end stop. But we should be faithful to God's word, and God's word does have the words before me. And what it means is, you shall have no other gods in my presence anywhere. So it doesn't mean, well, you shall have no other gods before me, as in, as long as I'm first in line, then you can line up your other idols that you fear, love, and trust in behind me. No, no, no. God wants no gods, no other gods in his presence. Now, of course, all other gods are false gods. And by the way, whenever you write the word God, if you're talking about the triune God, you should capitalize it. 
If you're talking about any false god, such as sports, so some, so, uh, or, or, or television, or video games, or maybe your family, or your friends, uh, those are small g gods. Now we're going to explain what this means, because you might say, well, how can my family be a god? Well, anything that we put our fear, love, and trust in, other than the triune god, can be an idol to us. And we all have them. So the way I always ask this question is I ask yourself, when you wake up on Sunday morning, you're supposed to be going to church, and something tempts you to not go to church. So I ask, what would, if there, whatever it is that you would rather be doing than going to church, or that you would rather be doing, even in church, instead of listening, and anything you would rather be doing in church, instead of listening, and instead of believing. So what you're thinking about at church, uh, when, when you should be focusing on God's word, those are your idols. And our idols change. Our idols are numerous. So an idol isn't just something that we fall down on our knees and we pray to or we worship. An idol is, uh, idols exist most importantly in the heart. So it's what we fear, love, and trust in besides the triune God. And so the first commandment is always driving us to repentance because we all have false gods. We'll talk about that more. Just two questions from now. So let's say the commandment again. You shall have no other gods. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So, now question 19. Who is the only true God? Simple answer. You need to know it, though. The only true God is the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons in one divine being. And in parentheses, you have the word the Holy Trinity. So, trinity, trinity means tri, three, inity, unity, three in one. Three persons have unity in one divine being. All right. Um, <clears throat> look at Bible verse 45, Deuteronomy 6, 4. This was the creed in Old Testament times. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So God is one. And then throughout scripture, we learn that there are three persons. So look at 2 Corinthians 3, verse 14, where Paul concludes his letter, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That was Bible verse number 48, by the way, 2 Corinthians 13, uh, verse 14. So we have this in Scripture, all throughout Scripture, <clears throat> where we have this threeness in oneness. Think of what uh, Isaiah, said, or Isaiah hears uh, in, in, uh, when he is called to serve the Lord in the beginning of Isaiah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And that should be reminiscent to you because we sing that uh, before the reception of the Lord's Supper every single Sunday. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. You remember it. All right, let's go to question 20. What does God forbid in the first commandment? Simple answer. God forbids us to have other gods. Now I want you to underline the word idolatry that's in parentheses. Because the sin against the first commandment is idolatry. We already talked a little bit about what idolatry is. It's anything we put our fear, love, and trust in besides the triune God. We make something, we make other things idols. So again, it could be sports. It could be television. It could be Ohio State football. It could be the Cleveland Browns, Cleveland Indians, or any of those Cincinnati teams. Or if you're living in Ohio, if you're living outside of Ohio, whatever sports team is in your neck of the woods. For me, it's sitting in a tree stand. It's sitting in a duck blind. It's walking through the woods on a fall, on a crisp fall morning. My idol is hunting and fishing, and I repent of it. And I know that to be, and I know it to be true. And there's no shame in confessing your sin. There's no shame in confessing it all. In fact, we should confess our sin. It's a lie of Satan to not confess what our idols are. It's important to confess them. There's no shame in that. The shame is when we don't confess them. Because when we don't confess our sins, when we are unrepentant, uh, we, will, we will receive the wrath of God and condemnation. So we are always driven to repentance. There's no shame in repenting of your sin, ever, no matter what it is. Now, it's shameful only because we have pride. We don't want others to know our weakness. We don't want, know, we don't want others to know how bad of people we really are because we want everyone to think we're good, right? I mean, life is easier if everyone thinks we're good. Uh, but remember, we're going to learn the Eighth Commandment. God has given us the gift of a good reputation. And a good reputation, in part, and you want to be respected, is confess your sin. Admit when you're wrong. It's okay. Ain't gonna hurt anybody. It's gonna just gonna hurt your pride. But thanks be to God, when you repent, you trust in the forgiveness Jesus offers, you're forgiven. Slate swiped clean. All right, circle Bible verse number 50. It's Matthew 4:10. This is Jesus' words, by the way, to Satan, when he says, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only 
shall you serve. Remember the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, in my presence, none other. I'm the only one. This is the Lord speaking. I'm the only, I'm your only God. So you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That's going to be on your test, because that is a great Bible verse that teaches us the first commandment. All right, so question 21. Now we're going to talk about the idols that we have. So when do other people, when do people have other gods? Well, they have other gods, A, when they regard and worship any creature or thing as God. This is obvious idolatry. This is very, very blatant, blatantly obvious. We get on our hands and knees and we pray to something else besides the triune God. Or we worship something other than the triune God. That's the blatant, obvious uh, committing of an idolatry. B, when they believe in a God who is not the triune God, Oh, now this starts limiting things here. So this means Muslims are idolaters. This means Mormons are idolaters. This means Jehovah's Witnesses are idolaters. Just inherent to their confession of faith because they don't believe in the triune God of the Apostles' Creed. Because they either think Jesus is just a man, or they think other things about Jesus that are not true. So it's important to know who Jesus is and believe who Jesus is. Like, Jesus, true God and true man, died for you. All right, C. And now we're getting into the more, the finer uh, senses. So the gross idolatry is when you're blatantly worshiping something other than God. And now we're getting into the more finer details of it. C. When they fear, love, or trust in any person or thing, as they should fear, love, and trust in God alone. And now here is where I would ask that question to you. So what are your idols? Don't be ashamed to admit them. And if you don't know them, you need to know. Because it's, it's, uh, that's deception of Satan to make you think that you don't have idols. And that would be a problem. Because all our life long we have something. You might even be just pride. In fact, if you don't know what your idol is, your idol is pride. Because you think you're a good person. And then when you think you're a good person on your own accord, a, 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 apart from the merits of Christ, you make yourself God. Small g God, of course. And we need to repent of that. So you see, the first commandment is always driving us to repentance. Let's keep going. Uh, 22. What does God require of us in the first commandment? Well, God requires that we fear, love, and trust in him above all things. Let's go to the next, oh, uh, let's flip the page to page 60. I want you to circle uh, Bible verse 71. And here's that uh, verse that I said you need to memorize a couple pages earlier. It's a summary of the first table of the law. Well, here it is written out, written out for you with the Bible verse number. So circle it. Number 71, Matthew 22, 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. In other words, you don't just love God with our mind, and as in, it's not just some intellectual endeavor. Oh, like I love studying theology. Oh, I knew people like that. I studied at Cambridge for a year, and there were people there who studied theology. That was going to be their livelihood, their living. They didn't believe in God, though. They didn't confess Him to be. Uh, they didn't confess Him to be their Lord and their God and their Savior. It was just an intellectual endeavor. So that's why we need to love our Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our minds. And with all our soul, with all our inmost being. So we do, should love him intellectually. Insofar as we should seek to learn more about God. That's important for the Christian to do. Now Jesus does say that we, that we should have a childlike faith. But what that means is to trust uh, without questioning. What it doesn't mean is we should stay immature for the rest of our lives. And think, oh, well, all I need to know is Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. That's the only hymn that I need to know or sing. I mean, yeah, sure, you need to know that. Because it's important to know the gospel. But Jesus doesn't want you to be babies. He wants you to grow up and be a mature adult. And, and I'm talking about spiritual, spiritually here. So I mean, a 15-year-old can be, a 12-year-old can be, can, I mean, that's not true. Because you continue to grow all your life. But you know what I mean. A 12-year-old can be more mature spiritually than a 38-year-old or a 50-year-old or a 35-year-old like myself at the time recording of this video. And so the point, though, is this once again. We should have a childlike faith insofar as we don't question things. So I tell my child I love him and he doesn't doubt it. I love you too, Daddy. Right? Children don't deny your love. You don't doubt it. As adults, we start to doubt God's love for us. We start to overthink things. We were talking about that. Remember when we talked about reason? Remember reason is the student. Scripture is the teacher. So we should have a childlike faith insofar as we just receive God's word for what it is. But we need to grow in God's faith too. And that's why we love the Lord our God. You shall love the Lord our God with your heart, your soul, and mind. All right, go to C. Remember, this is in response to the question, what does God require of us in the first commandment? So see, we, we trust in God above all things when we commit our lives completely to his keeping and rely on him for every for help in every need. So circle Bible verse 73, and this is a great verse that teaches us about reason being the student. 
Proverbs 3, 5. So circle once again, Bible verse 73. And the camera's having a rough time focusing today. What does it say? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. Oh, great exhortation for us. Always need to be cognizant of that verse. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. Just admit. And reason can often be a god. Reason can become an idol. Well, I'm, I got this all figured out. Oh, those Christians, they don't know what they're talking about. Now they're just sheep. They just follow whatever's taught. I mean, that's an insult, but it's actually kind of a good thing, right? Because Jesus says, the sheep hear my voice, and the sheep know the voice of their shepherd, and the sheep follow their good shepherd, who's Christ. So it's meant to be an insult, but it's actually not. It's actually it should be. Problem is, is we're our own idols. We want to be our own gods. And reason is often one of those biggest tempters. All right, so submit to the Lord. Reason is a student. Teacher is the, uh, the uh, scripture is the teacher. Hey, real quick, Old Testament books. Let's do it. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd 3rd John, Jude, Revelation. What does the law do? Shows us our sins. What does the gospel do? Shows us our Savior. What is the gospel? What God does for us, for Jesus' sake. What is the law? What we do for God and for our neighbor. First commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. What does this mean? We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Who remembers the three types of law? Moral, ceremonial, political. How, would, how did God give us the law? What are the three ways? On our hearts, on two tablets of stone, and in scripture. Good job. Verbal inspiration. Every word and every verb is inspired by God. Inerrancy. What does it mean? Without error. John 10, 35, and the scripture cannot be broken. John 5, 39, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, Jesus. Who is the key to unlocking scripture? Christ. <sighs> Deep breath. <clears throat> Question 23, bottom of page 60. Who is able to keep this in the other commandments? No person can keep any or all commandments perfectly except Jesus Christ. All those who have faith in him by the power of his spirit willingly strive to keep these commandments. And so if only Jesus can keep the commandments, that means we are always not keeping the commandments. So circle Bible verse 75. Right there. And it's 1 John 1, 8. We say this, by the way, when we have divine service setting one at Zion. It's part of our confession and absolution. It's part of the confession at the beginning of the service. 1 John 1, 8, let's read it together. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So if we say we don't have any idols, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we don't fear, love, and trust in things other than the triune God, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. I hope you're getting the point. Repent. Figure out what your idols are. Repent of them. Ask the Lord for his grace. Oh, Lord, help me do better. Cling to the forgiveness of sins, though, and trust that he, in fact, has forgiven you in Christ and wants you to do better and will enable you to do better. All right. Second commandment. Let's go. Move right on. Uh, second commandment is about God's name. First commandment is about God. Second commandment is about God's name. Let's say it together. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. Question 24. What do we say in this and in the following commandments? Why do we say we should fear and love God? Well, the fulfillment of all commandments must flow from the fear and love of God. So that's why we say we should fear and love God so that in every single one of the commandments from commandments 2 onward. So remember, the first commandment is we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. But commandments 2 onwards, it's we should fear and love God so that... Da, 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 da. Right? Okay. That was the purpose of that question. 
Uh, what is God's name? Question 25 at the bottom of page 61. God, as he has revealed himself to us, his essence and his attributes. So what is God's name, his essence and his attributes? So everything about God is part of God's name. So God is holy. He's just. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He's merciful. He's love. He's gracious. We're going to get all of those attributes when we get to the first article of the Creed in a few weeks. But for now, in the meantime, just know everything about God makes God who he is and is what God's name signifies. So it's just like me. You know, my name is Wes Hermoic. I've been given that name since birth. So everything about me makes up who I am. So when, I, when someone writes my name down, whatever your thoughts are about me, uh, whether I'm your pastor or whether I'm your son or I'm your dad, whatever my vocation relationship is to you, there's things you think about that pertain to me. That's what constitutes my name in essence and who I am, my attributes in essence. Same thing with God, more so with God because I, I change, right? Uh, humans adapt, we grow, we change, we differ, um, we lie, we deceive, we put on a front. We're not sometimes always the real person that we really are. God's not that way. God is the same. He changeth not. That's in Malachi. We'll learn that verse too. Humans change though. All right. Question 26. What does God forbid in the second commandment? <clears throat> in the second commandment, God forget, forbids us to misuse his name. Now, if you learn the old catechism, I want you to write misuse equals in vain, okay? And in vain means an empty meaning, all right? Man, it's so blurry today. So misuse equals in vain, empty meaning. And then circle that Bible verse right next to it. What is that, 87? Exodus 20, verse 7, which, by the way, Exodus 20, verse 7 is a Bible verse within the Ten Commandments. Uh, it's right after this misusing the name of the Lord your God. So basically what I'm doing is I'm making you memorize the second commandment. I'm making you memorize the verse after in the scripture. All right. So in vain means if we just say God's name without any meaning attached to it. If we're saying it for any other reason than when we're in trouble, when we're praying to him, when we're praising him, or when we're giving him thanks. So how is God's name misused? Question 27. God's name is misused when people speak God's name uselessly or carelessly, such as, OMG, write that as an example, such as, OMG, and you know what that stands for, oh my God. Shouldn't say that. Or if someone yells angrily, Jesus Christ, sinful. Don't take God's name in vain or use it with an empty meaning. So we should never use God's name in a sinful way, but we should always use God's name in the ways he has commanded us to use his name. Whenever we're in trouble, praying, praising, and giving thanks. So, in things that are forbidden, it says that when, uh, we should fear and love God through the meaning again. So, second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so we do not curse, swear, use satanic arts, lie, or deceive by his name, but call upon it in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. The first prohibition in that meaning was cursing. So, that's question 28 on page 63. What is cursing by God's name? Cursing by God's name is blaspheming. Now, underline the word blaspheme, and then write an arrow... And, and write the word disrespecting. So if you're blaspheming God, you are disrespecting him. And we disrespect him by either speaking evil of him or we mock him. So that would be cursing against God's name. All right, let's go down to question uh, 29. So what is swearing by God's name? Well, swearing by God's name is taking an oath in which we call on God to witness the truth of what we say or promise and to punish us if we lie or break our promise. So to swear is an oath or promise. It's not saying a bad word. Now, and when I say that, that doesn't mean that you are allowed to say bad words. We shouldn't cuss. In fact, uh, Paul in his letter, remember, God gives his law in what three ways? On our hearts, on two tables of stone, and in Scripture. And in the New Testament, there is a, as a, a, oh, I think it's Ephesians. End of Ephesians. I should have had the verse ready, but I don't. Where it talks about uh, not saying things um, that are useless or senseless or, or, or basically saying dirty things, profanity. Uh, that we should only be speaking things of God. So whenever we say things that are useless or vile or whatever, cuss words, for example, those, that, that is sin. Because uh, it's misrepresenting who we are as Christians. And we should only be speaking the things of God, uh, not the vile things of man. Okay, uh, question 30. So when are we permitted and even required to swear by God's name? Well, we are permitted, even required to take an oath by God's name when an oath is necessary 
for the glory of God or the welfare of our neighbor. So examples include the following. If your testimony in court, testifying in court, an oath of office. So when the president gets uh, inaugurated, he, make, he makes an oath of office. Wedding vows. Um, hopefully, Lord willingly, if you're one of our confirmation students, you're going to get married someday to a godly spouse and you will make wedding vows on that day. Now, when is swearing forbidden? So we shouldn't swear That's as in something like, I swear to God. We shouldn't do that when it's done falsely, thoughtlessly, or in sinful, uncertain, or important matters. Now, look at Bible verse 95, Matthew 5, verses 33 to 37. And you don't have to memorize it. But look on the top of page 65, the very last sentence. These are Jesus' words, because this is in his Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So in other words, when you're talking to someone and you say, I swear to God, this is, da, 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 this is true. Leave God out of it, right? Leave him out of it. That's, e that's evil. Because you're using God to try to validate your truth. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Let your words stand for what it is. Because if you're not a liar, people will believe you. The problem is, is people lie. We're all liars. All men are liars. All men and women are liars. We all lie from time to time because of pride. Because we want people thinking better of us. But if we didn't do that, we wouldn't have to say things like, I swear. We would just let, let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. That's the way it should be. All right, let's talk about question 32. So what is using uh, satanic arts by God's name? Well, it's idolatry. Look. Using satanic, look at the answer. Using satanic arts by God's name is using God's name in order to perform or claim to perform supernatural things with the help of the devil, such as casting spells, calling up a spirit, fortune telling, consulting the dead, or other occult practices. B, joining with or seeking the aid of people who practice these and similar satanic arts or worship Satan. Depending on horoscopes, this is C on page 66, or similar ways to foretell the future. These are all bad things. These are, these are all, because why? Why are they bad? Let's talk about that. Why is playing a game like Charlie Charlie? Well, that's a big thing that kids kids were playing a few years ago. Or uh, spinning a pencil around and, you know, pretending that, you know, calling upon demons or Ouija boards. Why is all that stuff bad? Well, if you're playing a Ouija board, for example, kids might, uh, the purpose of the game is to evoke fear. Well, what are we fearing? We're fearing a game more than we're fearing our triune God who condemns sin and also forgives sin in Christ. We ought to fear God, love him, and trust him, not some game. So that's why these things are bad, because they're taking our fear, love, and trust away from our triune God. All right, question 33. So what is lying and deceiving by God's name? Well, it simply is A, teaching false doctrine and saying that it is God's word of revelation. So anytime we speak an untruth about God, or if we some, some, someone might say something like, well, I'm a Christian, and I believe this, this, and this, but the scriptures teach opposite of that. They are lying by God's name. Because remember, God's name is his essence and all his attributes. And part of his essence and attributes is all of it's revealed in God's word, not all of it. What he wants us to know is revealed in God's word. What is necessary to know is revealed in God's word. And so if we say something like, well, I believe in this, or well, the, I, think the, I think the Bible teaches this, if, if we're... We're lying or deceiving. Either way, if it's not true, and so that's why it's a sin against the second commandment, and that's a serious sin. Man, it's like, I think the camera keeps moving. Just notice that now. Like, I keep like drifting off to the side. Okay, focusing. Keep face. So, teaching false doctrine, saying it's God's word of revelation. That's lying or deceiving by God's name. And then B. Oh, and this is where we often, this is where we often fall. Covering up an unbelieving heart or a sinful life by pretending to be a Christian. These are known as hypocrites. By the way, the word hypocrite in uh, Greek refers to like a mask. Someone who's in a play who's like wearing a mask. So they're out of, they're, they're playing a character. So a hypocrite is uh, a, a person who pretends to be a Christian. They're playing the character of a Christian. So a, so hypocrites exist all, all over the place. Church is full of them. All churches are full of them. Not full of them. All churches have them, right? It's people who come to church. They act, like, uh, they, they, they act like a Christian because they're there on Sunday. They put a smile on. Maybe they participate in the hymns. Maybe they even come up to the Lord's Supper to receive his body and blood. And then they leave there and they don't believe a word of what they've been taught. And they just live whatever scandalous life they want to. And they just say, oh, well, I can just come back to church on Sunday and just, you know, feel, feel good about myself. What does Paul say in Romans 6.1? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means! No! Christian life is one of repentance and faith. You'll hear me say that all the time. I say it all the time. So don't be a pretend Christian. Don't be a hypocrite. Now, this doesn't mean, of course, that we're not sinful. We all sin. 
I know that. And we should know that. We should confess it. Remember, that's what we've been doing this whole Bible study. Again, it's a lie of Satan to say that there's shame in confessing sin. The, law, the, the shame is sinning. That's the sin. That's the shameful thing. Confessing sin is not shameful at all. Because when we confess sin, remember, remember that verse that I had you memorize? Was it two, three pages before? On page 61. 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And that verse continues, but God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But when we confess our sins, God forgives us. Now remember, the forgiveness of sins has been earned by Christ on the cross 2,000 years ago. The way you receive that forgiveness is by faith. So the forgiveness of sins, all, all the sins you haven't even committed yet have been forgiven. But you don't receive that benefit of it apart from faith. So we trust in God's word. And by faith, we trust in the forgiveness that Jesus earns. And now that forgiveness becomes mine. And that's why my faith can't save you and your faith can't save me. Because each individual confesses their own sin and believes in the forgiveness of their own sin. All right. Question 34. What does God require of us in the second commandment? We should call upon his name in every trouble, pray, praise, and give thanks. Now this should remind us of hallowed be thy name in the Lord's Prayer. So this is the proper way to use God's name when we're in trouble. Look at uh, that Bible verse 104. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. You should memorize that one. I don't have that circled in my catechism, but I'm sp I think I'm supposed to. Because I know I had to memorize it. It's a good verse. Call upon me in the day of trouble. This is God speaking. I will deliver you. You will glorify me. Whenever we pray to him. So we pray to God. Right? That's using God's name. Oh Lord, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We call upon God's name. When we praise him, <clears throat> what's praise? So praise in the biblical sense. So praise is not just like, so this is the problem with contemporary music. That oftentimes people think that praise is about how God makes me feel. Oh, God makes me feel all happy and joyful inside, blah, blah, blah. Or it's just repeating a bunch of nonsense. Proper biblical praise. Look to the Psalms. Praise recounts God's actions in history and glorifies him for what he has done. And, and what we know he has done is revealing God's word. So good praise, and this is why good praise hymns in our hymnal, for example, uh, recall all the benefits that God has done throughout time. It recalls, I mean, Paul does this. He re we recall the Exodus. God leads his people um, out, of, out of Egypt from slavery. Uh, we talk about the, the, the water that comes from the rock. The manna God provides in the wilderness. And all throughout the Old Testament, all the stuff God's done, God, God has done for his people. And in the New Testament, what do we say in the Lord's Supper? We proclaim Christ's death until the day he comes. So in the Lord's Supper, we are praising God for giving up his only son to die for us. Now, of course, that makes us sad because it's our sin that put him on the cross. But we still praise him for it. Because of Jesus, we can go to heaven. So whenever we're in trouble... Pray to him, praising him, and then give thanks. So we should give thanks. Look at Bible verse 108. You don't have to memorize it, but give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we give praise to God. We thank him. And so when, I'm, when you're teaching your kids to pray someday, and when I teach my kids to pray, one of the first things that kids like to do when they pray is they say, God, please give me this. Please give me this. Please, please give me this. And, that, and that's okay. We should go to our Heavenly Father asking him for things. But we should also, in the same breath, and we should and we should also teach them in the same breath to give thanks to God. And so what we do with our kids is after they say their 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 petitions, they ask God for things, and I say, okay, now what are you thankful for? Well, mommy, daddy, you know, uh, my brothers, my sister, my toys, my grandmas, my papas, church, our pastor. We thank God for all the things He has given us. Okay. Uh, I think that's going to be it. Yep, that's it. That's it. That's all we had to get to uh, through the catechism today. So what we'll do um, is we will uh, close with our prayers. So let's close with, uh, let's pray together Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. 
Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's pray Luther's uh, evening prayer. I thank thee, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. All right, next class, class four. <clears throat> We're going to have a slight break from the commandments. And I do this on purpose because, remember, confirmation is a strengthening of the faith given to us in our baptisms. And so I space my baptism units out all throughout the year so there's this constant reminder of our baptisms. Because, remember, even the sign of the cross is reminding us of our baptisms. So next week, we are going to learn the first part, the, the, uh, the first part of baptism, the nature of baptism. Um, it's on page, I believe, 204 in your small catechisms. Uh, and we will talk about sin, so why we need to be baptized. We'll talk about uh, the different kinds of sin. And in the meantime, continue to go over your commandments, continue to re re review your creeds. Uh, I'm sorry, your Old Testament book and your New Testament books. <clears throat> and uh, we'll, we'll meet back up here next week for lesson number four. And uh, God be with you, so learn that first part of the, uh, of the baptiz of baptism again. And I keep memorizing those Bible verses. And the best way to do it is just to keep reading them. All right? All right, take care, everybody.